I want to tell you a story about a man I should have never met. Michael had high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, and chronic fatigue. His body was weathering the kinds of things we typically don't see until middle age. He said to me, Doc, I don't know why I have all these problems, but man, I've been through some stuff. But here's the thing, Michael wasn't old. He was only 26. He also had this crippling anxiety, bipolar disorder. He smoked cigarettes and was battling an addiction to heroin and prescription drugs. And what was bothering him the most was his anxiety. It had recently worsened and he wasn't sleeping well. He kept having panic attacks. As he told me his problems, I, I couldn't help but think to myself, it's no surprise that your anxiety has worsened lately. Because I was seeing him in a clinic, a clinic that was located in a jail. Michael was locked up, awaiting trial, housed in a large room with 30 other men with problems similar to himself. And in that moment, I wondered, how do we get here? How does a 26-year-old man have all of these medical problems? And as a physician, where do, I, where, where do I even start? See, I work at a public safety net hospital, a place that has provided care for some of the most disadvantaged and underserved communities in Chicago. And as an internist and pediatrician, I provide care for people across the entire life course. And whether I'm seeing patients in a jail or on the west side or in a school health center, one thing I learned very quickly is that our health is so much more than labs on a page or a medication list or what's written in a patient's chart. Lived experiences matter and inform health. Narratives matter. But during our medical training, I, I wasn't always taught this. You know, some days it felt like I was learning how to do disease damage control more than anything else. And over time, I started to accept, well, this must just be how medicine is. But in my last year of training, just three months before I was going to graduate, I attended what became the most important lecture of all my training, something that profoundly changed the way I view health altogether. And the topic was on adverse childhood experiences, how decades of research from public health and neuroscience and psychology have all found that significant childhood adversity is linked with several negative health outcomes and how the way that's happening is through how adversity and trauma affects our brain. Now the idea I wanna share with you all today is how for me, understanding this science and then seeing it at play in the lives of my patients gives me hope for an idea I call systemic empathy. Systemic empathy. Well, keep this term in mind because I want to build my case for it. And let me start by giving you the Cliff Notes version on what this whole thing on childhood adversity is all about. You see, in the late 90s, a landmark public health study done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente surveyed over 17,000 adults about their history of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs for short. And these ACEs spanned 10 different categories and included questions like, were you ever sexually abused? Was anybody in your household ever incarcerated? Were your parents ever so drunk or too high to take care of you? And what they found was the higher number of ACEs a person had, the higher the risk was for some of the most common health and behavioral problems in the US, things like substance abuse, mental illness, and even chronic disease. So if a person had four of any of these ACEs, they would be at a seven times greater risk of having alcoholism compared to someone with none of these. For lung disease, that's four times. And for heart disease and cancer, over two times. And with six or more ACEs, the average life expectancy goes from 80 years down to 60. Now, what's even more stunning about this research is the part where the brain comes in. Because this is the primary organ that's targeted by ACEs and, and leads to the health risk behaviors and chronic diseases that we're talking about. And to put it simply, ACEs cause toxic stress. The kind of stress that is so severe that it can disrupt normal brain development, function, and even brain growth. Toxic stress causes overactivity of the part of the brain that regulates fight or flight, but it disrupts and stunts the development of the part of the brain that's important for planning, reasoning, and controlling impulsivity. And this has real life implications for what's happening in our city. The crime lab at University of Chicago has found that when it comes to gun violence in Chicago, there is a troubling pattern. And it tends to involve young men, there's a disagreement, there's an impulsive action with a gun around leading to a dead body. Again, impulsivity, we care about this because it's regulated by a part of the brain that is significantly affected by toxic stress. 
Which brings us back to Michael, 26 years old, in jail, and with an astounding burden of disease. Michael had at least six aces, if not more. Both of his parents battled addictions and had mental illness. His childhood was a story full of abuse and neglect. And drugs were his way of escaping from it all. And this wasn't the first time he had been in jail. In fact, just three months before we met, he had just been released after spending about a year in jail. And during this prior stint, he embraced being sober and was getting help for his anxiety and bipolar disorder. But when he was released, he showed up at his doctor's office and was turned away because his insurance had expired while in jail. With no medications and his anxiety quickly escalating, Michael bought pills off the street, quickly spiraled out of control, and within weeks, he was arrested again. I couldn't help but think our healthcare system failed him on multiple levels, not just on the obvious problem of Michael not having access to health services, but going even farther back to my own training in medicine. Because if it wasn't for that one lecture I attended, I never would have understood him this way. I mean, he would have been just another guy who lacked the will and the self-control to stay clean. So I believe that the science of adversity and trauma drives us towards something we really need in our human service institutions, what I call systemic empathy. Because what the data show is that narratives do matter, that we can't just look at people as a collection of their problems and diseases, but in order to help and to heal, we have to understand where a person is coming from. And the first critical pivot of being trauma-informed is when we interact with a patient or colleague or employee, we stop saying to them, what's wrong with you? But instead, we ask, what's happened to you? Systemic empathy builds on this framework and is a call to normalize this mind and heart pivot of not what's wrong with you, but what's happened to you. And it's a call to scale it up to meaningful cross-sector interventions. So what does that mean? What would it look like in our institutions? What would it look like for Michael? Well, what if we took our best treatment for addiction in the community, a program that includes counseling and group sessions and medications to help control cravings, and we simply did this program in the jail? And what if, if a person was going to be released, we made sure that their barriers to continuing treatment and therapy in the community were addressed? Well, I'm glad to say that this isn't a hypothetical example, but a real program that was recently started at the jail. And it ha the reason it happened, I believe, is because a group of social workers and administrators and physicians, they got together and they looked at this problem of addiction through a lens of systemic empathy. It's not rocket science. It's simply changing our frame of reference away from pragmatism or profits and back on the person. But here's the thing. Right now, this kind of example is the exception and our patients cannot afford for pieces of the health system to take action until our entire health and human services system is aware and understands the impact of trauma. All we'll have to talk about are these one-off examples. Systemic empathy requires systemic change. And so I submit to you this. If we ascribe to this idea of systemic empathy, the first critical and tangible thing we can do is to teach the science of adversity and trauma as core material in our human service institutions. If we can have the courage to build an ethos of systemic empathy, we need to be willing to lay the foundation for it as well. And that means that every future human service worker, from medical students, nursing students, to future police officers, educators, and litigators, and politicians are all taught in the science of trauma. A long time ago, Hippocrates, he said, it's far more important to know the person who has a disease than to know what sort of disease the person has. Of course, he didn't have any of the data that we have today, but he was onto something. If the systems had been working for Michael, I never would have met him, but I did. And I'm glad I got to know him instead of just his problems. Thank you. <laughs>